classical mechanics, the father of physics and perhaps of scientific thought, was initially developed in the 1600s by the famous natural philosophers of the 17th century such as Isaac Newton, building on the data and observations of astronomers including Tycho Brahe, Galileo and Johannes Kepler. Classical mechanics concerns itself with the mathematical description of the motion of physical bodies, tying together the concepts of force, momentum, velocity and energy to describe the behavior of macroscopic objects. Though it was developed nearly 400 years ago, many of the basic tenets of classical mechanics hold for common situations excluding microscopic particle dynamics, high velocity motion and large scale mechanics. Classical mechanics holds accurately for scales from 1 picometer, which is 2 to the power of minus 12 meters, to 10 to the 30 meters. Due to its consistent success, classical mechanics has been widely studied by physicists and mathematicians alike. Even though it must rely on quantum mechanics for small scale motion and special relativity for high velocity travel, it is considered a mostly complete and solved set of theories. However, there is still one problem in classical mechanics which remain unsolved. The solution. In fact, whether a solution is guaranteed to exist to the general case of the Navier-Stokes equations for fluid dynamics is unknown. And now, ladies and gentlemen, have fun with an introduction to the derivation of the Navier-Stokes equations. Hey guys, welcome to the derivation of the Navier-Stokes equations. And I hope that you like the small intro to classical mechanics and let's jump right into the presentation. So here a brief recap of the CFD introduction that I've already made. A little bit of history concerning the Navier-Stokes equations. So the motion of fluid is an exploratory topic for human beings and the evolution of mathematical models emerged at the end of the 19th century after the Industrial Revolution. The initial appropriate description of the viscous fluid motion had been indicated in the paper Principia by Sir Isaac Newton in 1687, in which dynamic behavior of fluids under constant viscosity was investigated. Later, Daniel Bernoulli in 1738 and Leonard Euler in 1755 subsequently derived the equation of inviscid flow, which is now expressed as the so-called Euler's inviscid equations. Even though Claude-Louis Navier in 1827 Augustin Louis Cauchy in 1828, Simeon Denis Poisson in 1829, and Adama Savenon in 1843 had carried out studies to explore the mathematical model of fluid flow, they had overlooked the viscous slash frictional force. In 1845, Sir George Stokes had derived the equation of motion of a viscous flow by adding Newtonian viscous terms, thereby the Navier-Stokes equations had been brought to their final form which has been used to generate numerical solutions for fluid flow ever since. So the fundamental equations for fluid mechanics are the conservation of mass, which I have already described in another video. In today's video we will talk about the conservation of momentum, slash the Navier-Stokes equations, and we have the conservation of energy, which might come soon in case you want to have a derivation of the energy equations. This is important if we deal with compressible fluids. Quick recap of the conservation of mass, as you can see right here, it's in the integral form. Of course, we have the surface integral in the second term, but as you know from the mass conservation derivation, we can transform the surface integral into the volume integral by using Gauss's theorem or the so-called divergence theorem. Here we have the conservation of momentum with a term dealing with the change in time, the nonlinear convective term, then we have pressure and viscous forces as well as extra forces. Rewriting the equation, we get the following form, and this is nothing else than Newton's second law of motion. Please keep that in mind, because at the end of the video, this will be important again. So stick with me. So here the note again, that in the beginner's guide for CFD, I have missed the velocity term, just in case you will watch the video or already watched it. So the conservation of mass, just to have a quick recap, is that the temporal change of mass inside of our control volume is the flows into the control volume minus the flows out of the control volume. For the conservation of momentum, we have something similar. We have that the temporal change of momentum inside the control volume is equal to the momentum flow into the control volume minus the momentum flow out of the control volume plus forces acting on our control volume. So we will have a look at a small infinitesimal control volume as depicted on the left again. 
and momentum as defined as mass times velocity. So we take the definition of mass, which is nothing else than d rho by dt times dx dy dz, and add the velocity to it, namely v as a vector. So we have the same approach as for the mass conservation, but with a definition of the momentum right now. So recap for the mass continuity equation again, so that you see what approach we took. We had a look at what's coming into our control volume on the left side, and we had a look how the component in x direction changes along the x direction. So for the momentum conservation, we just add the velocity, and you end up with the following form, as you can see on the slide. So we work with that in every direction right now. So here we have that p times u times u changes its value in x direction with d by dx of rho times u times u times dx. Here we have all the momentums acting on the x faces. So we have three momentums acting on each x phase. So we have six in total with the change along each component respectively. The same goes for the y direction or y faces as well as for the z faces. In case you want to have a closer look at the equations, just pause the video. What I would advise you to do is to take some notes from time to time so you will retain the information better. So we move on. This is not the only contributions for the changes in momentum. So what is actually missing? We have normal and shear stresses that are missing and we have body forces that are missing. Normal and shear stresses. So let's talk about them first. And there's a convention. And the convention is that the first index indicates which surface the stress is acting on and the second index indicates the direction of the coordinate. So what does it actually mean? That means that if we have an arrow on the top z surface, for instance, showing into the y direction, we have tau zy. And the first index is z because it's on the top z surface, but the arrow is showing into the y direction. Similarly, we have tau xy because it's acting on the x surface, but pointing into the y direction. We have also body forces, and these are forces acting throughout the volume of a body. For example, we have gravitation, electric and magnetic forces, and some more. The body force is indicated by the vector k, which can be kx, ky, and kz, with the units in newton per cubic meter. So here you can see the normal and shear stresses, indicated by tau xx, tau xy, tau xz, and the changes along the direction. The same goes for the y surfaces as well as the z surfaces. So we assemble the equations now according to the formula that we have already described. So we first take the x direction. For clarification, I have colored all the arrows showing in x direction, positive or negative, in blue. And these are the components that will go into the x equation. So if we assemble everything, we get the following formula. So on the left hand side, we have the term as it is. On the right hand side, we have the momentum coming into our system minus the momentum going out of our system times the surface we are dealing with. The same goes for y and the same goes for z. Then we have, of course, our body forces and we add to that our normal and shear stresses respectively. That means we have for the x direction the following term, for the y direction the second term, and for the z direction the third term. Now, as you can see, these terms cancel out because they are identical. And what we end up with is the equations for the x, y, and z direction. So these are theoretically all the equations we need, but we need to answer the following questions. Question number one is, which term includes the thermodynamical pressure? For instance, when we look at gases. And secondly, is there a relationship between stresses tau and velocity components u, v, and w? And yes, there is. If we assume that we deal with a Newtonian fluid, we can say that tau equals mu times du by dz, for instance, where mu is the proportionality constant and du by dz the gradient. Just a quick recap, maybe you know it already from your lectures. What is the stress tensor and how is it defined? So the stress tensor, first of all, is a symmetric tensor with six independent components because we have the symmetry condition applied. That means that only these six components are independent. And this component is identical to this component. Tz, tau Zx is identical to tau Xz and tau Yz is identical to tau Zy. 
So the stress sensor can be split into two parts. The first part is the so-called hydrostatic stress sensor or volumetric stress sensor. This part of the stress sensor changes the volume of the body. And we have the so-called stress deviator tensor, which distorts the body. And we can write it like that, where the stress deviator is Sij and the stress tensor is P delta Ij. Now you might ask, what is this delta Ij? This is the so-called Kronecker delta, and it equals 1 if the indices are the same, and it equals to 0 if the indices are not the same. So if we have delta 1, 1, P stays in the equation. If we have delta 2, 2 and delta 3, 3, the same happens. But if we have delta 1, 2, for instance, then the pressure in the stress tensor vanishes. For the pressure, in an inviscid flow, we have no shear stresses and only the normal stresses are acting. It's a good approach to take the pressure as the average of the normal stresses. And we take the negative direction because the pressure is acting. And we have the minus because the pressure is acting on our volume, meaning that the vector shows to our contra volume and not away from it. So we can also separate the stresses, as you can see right here, with the equation as you know it from the slides before. And we can just rewrite it in terms of Sij equals sigma Ij minus P delta Ij. And applied to our notation, we can say that it's nothing else than tau xx equals to sigma xx minus P. And the same for the y and z direction. And we put it into our equations that we have already derived. And what we end up with is the following equations. The question now is, where does our material law come into play? This is the so-called Stokes hypothesis, and we take these equations now as a postulate. Of course, you can derive these equations, and if you are more interested into how to derive the Stokes hypothesis, I can either do a video on that, or you can find more information in the book from Schlichting from 1968, where he explains this in detail. So if you put everything to our equations, we get the preliminary equations, which look like this for x, y, and z respectively. We can use the product rule from the, for the left-hand side, and you end up with the following equations. And if you recall from slide 18 of the mass conservation equation that we said that this equation here holds, then this last part of the equation is equal to zero, and u times zero is zero anyway. So this term goes out of the equation, and what we then have is the left-hand side of the Navier-Stokes equation looks like this, and we can just rewrite it in a more compact form. We put rho out of the equation, and we say we have du by dt plus u times du by dx, and so on. Here you can now see the final general form of the Navier-Stokes equations, and if we deal with an incompressible flow, we can just take the assumption that the divergence of our velocity field is equal to zero, so that means that the terms, as you can see right here, drop out, and we end up with our final form that looks like this. And we can write it in a more pretty form, which is the so-called vector notation. So we can rewrite it in that form that we say rho times dv by dt plus v times the divergence times v equals k minus the pressure gradient, so minus the gradient of p, plus mu times the Laplace operator, so Laplacian of the velocity field. And I have rewritten the Laplacian operator below, so what it actually means. And we can even rewrite the Laplacian operator as the divergence of the gradient. So we have two times nabla, so to speak, which is nothing else than nabla squared of the velocity field. So if you have any questions regarding that, feel free to ask in the comment section. So I hope this is clear so far. Let's move on. So for an incompressible flow, we have the fundamental equations, which look like this. We have, of course, our Navier-Stokes equations plus the mass continuity equation, as you can see on the bottom. So what we get are two equations that build a system of four partial nonlinear differential equations of second order, where we have four unknowns, namely u, v, and w, as well as our pressure p. So we can even rewrite the terms in the brackets of our Navier-Stokes equation. We have something called the Lagrangian reference frame and the Eulerian reference frame. So we can see on the left-hand side where we have the so-called substantial derivative, which is nothing else than a Lagrangian reference frame. And on the right-hand side, how we derived it is the so-called Eulerian frame. We have the local change in red and the convective term in purple. So here again, S is the substantial temporal change where we 
which is nothing else than the Lagrangian approach. And on the right hand side, we have the local temporal change at a fixed location plus the convective spatial change due to convection from one place to another, which is nothing else than the Eulerian frame. So for more information, have a look at this slide right here. So if we have a Lagrangian reference frame, we follow our fluid particle. And if we do that, we get something called the path line. And if we are in the Eulerian system, we have a fixed volume and we look at the volume and how the fluxes change inside of the volume over time, which is nothing else than the Eulerian frame, as I mentioned, we can determine something called the streamlines that you might already know from your CFD simulations. Also, please keep in mind that it's mathematically enormously more convenient to use the Eulerian reference frame. And here we have the beautiful Navier-Stokes equations again, where we have the mass indicated by the blue row. Then we have the acceleration term and that's equal to the force. And as you can see, we have mass times acceleration equals force. And again, that's nothing else than Newton's second law of motion. So that's it so far. As future potential video topics, we have something about turbulence that we can have a small beginner's guide about turbulence, what turbulence is, how you can define it. We can even talk about the Navier-Stokes equation, not only what the million dollar question is, but also about forms of the Navier-Stokes equation. For instance, the comparison between compressible and incompressible flow, viscid versus inviscid, laminar versus turbulent, and steady versus unsteady, and what it actually means in terms of the Navier-Stokes equation. Then of course, you guys also wanted to have a video about the wall functions, what is y plus. That's also very interesting. Then a very cool topic and very easy to understand, in my opinion, is if we derive the stability criteria when we have a look at the so-called Peclet number in a convection diffusion problem that can be programmed using MATLAB. And then I can explain you what you can interpret into these stability criteria. Also, a nice video would be how to properly manage a CFD project. And I also thought about doing a simulation Sunday where we can take some either FEA or CFD simulations and have a look at them. Of course, as always, if you have any questions or ideas from your side, please put them down in the comment section. And of course, all slides can always be downloaded from my Patreon page. Here are the sources, and I would say that's it for today's video. I hope that you enjoyed it, and if you have any questions, as I already mentioned, please put them down in the comment section. Make sure not to forget to hit the like button, as always. Please leave a comment down below, because you know the algorithm prefers videos if they have more likes and comments. And as always, make sure to keep engineering your mind. See you in the next one.